So we're going to go from verse uh, 24 down to 25. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be blessed uh, by the latest lesson. Now, <clears throat> while we're preparing for that, uh, this Sunday, this Sunday is uh, Pentecost Sunday. And so you don't want to miss that. Uh, it is, and I'll refer to this in, in the lesson uh, today, uh, is the time the church became visibly uh, known in the earth. Uh, and so, uh, the, since the church was visible, uh, Pentecost, the very first one, was uh, in the Exodus, the, the 19th chapter, uh, and Israel was God's church in the wilderness, although not yet formalized as the church of God, um, because Christ had not yet died. And so the church was about the divided Christ, uh, it was visible until after the, the, the death of Christ. And so uh, Pentecost, uh, for us, uh, is the birthday uh, of the church. Uh, and so come prepared, Sunday, it's a birthday party. Uh, we will celebrate uh, the church and the uh, induction of the church into the earth and, and all that entails. And so uh, come ready for that. It's been a wonderful time as we celebrate uh, Pentecost. Uh, well, let's get started today. Uh, Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 24 through 29 it is uh, our focus. When God calls us to a particular task, we must uh, surrender to uh, his call. There are, are three words that I will be driving home uh, today, and that is uh, surrender, submission, and obey. Uh, those are the three words, and you're going to hear me say this uh, over and over again. Uh, surrender, submission, and uh, uh, obey. Uh, Alice, uh, uh, praise the Lord to you as well. Uh, so the, those three words, uh, surrender, submission, uh, uh, obey, you'll hear me say it over and over again. It is pertinent for us as the body of Christ uh, to understand the significance of what that means. As a matter of fact, the reality is the three watchwords for the kingdom is submission, surrender, and, and obey. If you really want to enjoy your life as a child of God in the kingdom of God, uh, learn to submit, learn to surrender, learn to, to obey. If you really want to maximize uh, your ministry, uh, learn to submit, learn to, learn to surrender, learn to, to obey. If you want to enjoy the abundant life that Christ provides you, and also eternal life, surrender, submission, obey. Uh, I'm telling you, these three, if you, when you learn those three things, and you enter into your life, Christian life, uh, or life in the kingdom of God, it's so much more enjoyable for you as we submit, as we surrender, and as we uh, uh, obey. Um, so, the Lord, um, when he calls us to, to work for him, we must surrender the call. We must obey uh, the call. There really is no greater joy on earth, earth than uh, serving uh, the Lord. No greater joy can one have uh, in giving uh, their life for service for him. However, it comes with a cost. The call of God always comes with a cost. There is a price uh, to pay uh, to do the work of the Lord, there is a price to pay to do ministry. Two scriptures I, I'd like to call to your attention. Um, they're both very similar in, in their wording, uh, only one's a uh, slight difference. First one is Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 24. It says, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. Matt, uh, in Luke 9, 23, it says, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. Uh, take up his cross, and then the difference between the two texts is the word daily and follow me. Now, I'd, I'd like to, uh, to emphasize th this one point, though. Uh, consider this. Uh, if anyone will come uh, uh, after me, uh, he says, let him deny uh, himself. Before we get to the cross, before we talk about taking up your cross, before we get to taking up your cross daily, the scripture indicates deny yourself. The reality is, when you consider Jesus Christ and what he did going to the cross, he had to deny himself before he actually uh, went to the cross to die for our sins. How so? When did he do it? In the Garden of Gethsemane, remember the prayer uh, of Jesus. He says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass to me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus, in that moment, uh, surrendered to the divine will. Uh, and then, uh, by surrendering to the divine will, uh, he denied what he wanted to do. Because uh, his will was, if it's possible, let, let, let it pass. I don't want to have to, to go through this. 
but he surrenders to a divine will, deny himself, therefore, he then goes unto the cross. If we are uh, to follow Christ and do the word of the Lord, we have to learn to uh, deny uh, ourselves, then take up the cross and follow after the Lord. Now, think about this. Uh, her grace and peace to you. Um, for the disciples, when they heard Jesus make this statement, when they heard him uh, say this, this was uh, quite profound for them because uh, in their day and time, they were used to seeing people walk around who had their, uh, their sentence of death. They saw them walking with crosses. And so can you imagine, here you are, and you live in that day. If you saw someone walking with a cross, you already knew when you saw them, they're on their way for the last, this is the last few moments uh, of their life. Uh, in a few hours from now, perhaps a few days from now, uh, their life will be no more. They will end up, uh, 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 death will overtake them at, at some point in time. We only know that that's coming. Um, and so, give you like this. Today, when you see someone in a squad car, now you're automatically uh, 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 assuming you know, they're on the way uh, to jail. It's just, uh, so when you see them uh, in the back, you see that person on the side of the road, and the handcuffs are being placed, on them and they're being placed into the car. Your thoughts are automatically, they're going to jail, they're going to the city, they're going to prison. So they, one of those things are, are kept, they did something that now necessitated uh, this, this arrest take place and then they be taken away. So for the disciples, uh, they were used to seeing someone walk around with a cross going uh, for execution. And so when Jesus says to them, if you're going to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross, uh, follow me, they know that uh, this means I'm going to have to die to myself. Hallelujah. When was the last time that you took the time uh, to die uh, to yourself? Now, if we add in uh, Luke, the ninth chapter, in verse 23, uh, he says, that take up your cross daily, uh, which means that we should be daily dying to uh, ourselves. Daily, uh, we should be surrendering up uh, our lives in an effort to follow after uh, the Lord. And so uh, it comes with serving God comes with a cost. Doing ministry comes with a cost. And we have to consider, am I willing you know, to, to take the cost of ministry? Am I, have I evaluated how much of my life is God requiring? How much of my time? Because you can't do the work of the Lord without uh, giving up your, your time. You can't serve God without giving up of your time. It's going to require your energy. It's going to require your uh, time. You're going to have to sacrifice somewhere uh, in uh, your life. You're going to miss out on something if you decide that you're going to personally uh, serve God or give Him of uh, your, your life and or also of uh, your time. And so today what we're going to do, we're going to investigate the need for and the demand that's placed upon uh, servant leaders. Again, we want to uh, we want to uh, deal with in this lesson the need for and the demand uh, for servant uh, leaders. Uh, uh, repeat these words after me in, in just this uh, simple prayer. Say, Lord. Lord. Uh, the other side of the week. Say, Lord. Lord. Help me. Help me to surrender. To surrender. To submit. To submit and to obey, to obey. Your, will. your will. Yeah, that's what we want. We want, we want the Lord to help us to surrender, to submit, and to obey uh, His will. Um, as we're preparing uh, for the lesson, uh, what did you learn from uh, last week? What did you remember from uh, last week's uh, lesson? Yes. Peace exists when there's true Okay. Yes, absolutely. Peace exists uh, when there's true reconciliation, and, that, and that's interesting because. In all three Bible studies, uh, that is the first thing that somebody said every single time, is that peace exists when there's true uh, reconciliation. You can't have reconciliation without having uh, peace. Someone else? Yes. That the, um, all the, the truth, it had um, disobeyed God because it had helped Adam and Eve. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, creation of the tree helped. Help the man to sin and cover up uh, his, his sins. Like you will say something else. I do. Okay. Um, um, Christ made peace between man and God. Okay. And I'm going to say good morning. Super good. Okay. And um, Christ became a substitute and paid the price for his sin. Good. Excellent. Yeah, you, 
Christ made peace, and he, and he was the substitute for our, 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 our sins. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, Trina says that God's children create peace. Absolutely. God's children uh, create uh, peace. Those who are watching out by Facebook Live, you guys can help us out. Please, if you will, hit that share button. Someone will be blessed by this lesson today. Especially if you know someone that is in leadership. Uh, hit that share button today, and they'll be blessed by uh, today's lesson. Let's go. Verse 24, Colossians uh, chapter 1. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am feeling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, uh, the church. Uh, this is an extraordinary verse, brothers and sisters. Paul says first, he rejoices in the suffering uh, that he has for the sake of others. And then he also says that in my flesh I am feeling up I'm feeling up uh, in the, what's lacking in others for the affliction that Christ has received for his church. So uh, it's like a glass is being filled. Paul says, first, I'm, I rejoice, I'm, I'm suffering for, for uh, your sake. But he also says, uh, I'm being filled up. Like I'm, I am, uh, uh, it's like water being poured into me and I'm being filled up with affliction. But I'm glad about that because that, that helps advance Christ. And he'll also advance uh, his church. 2 Timothy 2, 12 says, If we suffer, uh, we shall also reign with him, referring to Christ. If we deny him, he will deny us. The church needs servant leaders who are willing to suffer for others. That is a church, the body of Christ. Now, I know that's a strong statement there. Uh, the church needs servant leaders who are willing to suffer for others at the body of Christ, that is, the church. As a matter of fact, according to scripture, it is a privilege to suffer afflictions for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It is a privilege to suffer afflictions for Jesus Christ. Now, I would at this point, uh, but I won't do that to, to you all. I spared everyone else, and so I'll, I'll do that to uh, you, you all. But I, I would say something like, you know, Lord, thank you. We'd be asking God, Lord, thank you for allowing me to be afflicted uh, for you. you know, and uh, most of us are like, you know, I don't want to say that because <laughs> I'm not really, not really too glad. Uh, but the reality is, it's actually a privilege uh, to suffer uh, for Christ, to suffer afflictions for Christ. Uh, the Lord tells us this. And Jesus, before he left, says, if they hate you, don't worry, they hate me also. Uh, if you're persecuted for my name, just, just don't worry, I, I was persecuted uh, as well. So when we deal with afflictions and we deal with uh, suffering, suffering is the word for, it's for hardship, it is for pain. Uh, afflictions deals with uh, trouble, it deals with tribulation, it deals with persecution, pressure or uh, distress. So the believer uh, will oftentimes go through hardship and will oftentimes go through pressure or uh, distress or persecution for the, not just for your own benefit, but rather for the benefit of other people that they might be able to grow, that they might be able to connect uh, with God. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this, that your suffering help someone else to connect with God. Mm. Uh, your affliction, if you'll go through affliction in the proper way, you'll help someone else to grow uh, in Jesus Christ. Are you willing to go through affliction that somebody else might benefit and grow and connect uh, with God? Are, are you willing, are you willing to have hardship in your life that someone else might have a deeper connection or might be able to <laughs> further develop uh, in, in the Lord. When we suffer, know that uh, Christ suffers along uh, with us. When we suffer, are we, uh, Christ suffers along uh, with us. What do you mean by that? Consider this. Remember uh, in Acts the ninth chapter when uh, Saul at the time was not yet the name that was Paul, he was uh, persecuting the church. He had orders to go to uh, Damascus and to persecute uh, the, the, the Christians that were there uh, in, in Damascus. On his way there, you know, the story shows us, uh, God stops him in his tracks. He is stricken blind for uh, this moment. And Jesus speaks to him and says, uh, Saul, Saul, 
Why are you persecuting me? Now, uh, based on chronology, Jesus was not there physically in the earth. Uh, there was no physical existence of Jesus Christ in the earth. He had already died, uh, rose again, and go back in, in, into heaven. Uh, so uh, the Lord was saying uh, to Saul that when you're persecuting uh, my people, you're persecuting me. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Consider, we are made alive with God. We are uh, raised up with Christ. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're buried with Christ in baptism unto death. Which means then, if Christ is with us in our conversion experience and also in our uh, glorification experience, that means he's with us in our moments of affliction as well. So whenever we suffer persecution, Christ suffers of persecution along with us. He doesn't leave you uh, when you're persecuted. He's there with you uh, in persecution. He's there with you uh, during the affliction. He's there with you uh, in, in your trouble. So you're not by yourself when you go through the trouble. Christ is there with you. Everybody else in life might abandon you and walk away from you because of the pressure that you're in or the hardship that you're going through. Uh, but uh, kind of an honor and a privilege to suffer for, for Christ knowing that he is with you. Keep in mind, he made you a promise. I will never leave you. Neither will I forsake you. I will be with you, he says, always, even to the end of the age. And so the ever-abiding presence of God will not abandon you in your darkest hour. I love that. The ever-abiding presence of God will not abandon you in your hardship. The ever-abiding presence of God will not abandon you while you're in your affliction. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, how you go through afflictions will teach somebody else to handle uh, their uh, uh, affliction. Can you be strong uh, while you go uh, through this? And knowing that uh, as you go through this, Christ is there uh, with me. Uh, Christ is uh, giving me strength. And the truth is, as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, mm -hmm. uh, David told us that, that you're with me. And, and it was walking through the valley that you discover the ever-abiding presence of God he does not abandon you while you're in your problems. He doesn't abandon you while you're in your uh, uh, affliction. And so uh, Christ uh, suffers along uh, with us. Uh, and Paul, Paul saw this and was willing to pay an ultimate price that others might be able to be reached for Christ. Uh, Paul did this in such a way that he pours out his own life. Uh, second, second Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, I am a drink offering, or I'm being poured out as a drink offering. And as uh, Paul says about being poured out as a drink offering, that's what you get. I have fought a good fight. I have uh, finished my course. I have kept the faith. And from now on, or henceforth, it's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And I love that. So Paul is saying, I'm pouring out my all, my all. How much of yourself are you willing to give away to do the work of God? Uh, at what percentage are you willing to give up your life to do the works uh, of Christ? Colossians chapter 1 verse 24 teaches that the servant leader, uh, when he suffers, actually completes the suffering of Christ uh, in the earth. What do you mean? Uh, Christ suffered, Christ endured while in the earth. Uh, his ministry still goes on. Therefore, if the ministry of Christ still goes on in the earth, when we suffer with him, then uh, we are completing the suffering of Christ in the earth. We're completing the ministry of Christ uh, in uh, the earth. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, gave of himself daily for us. Jesus Christ poured out his life while he was in the earth daily for us. Now, most of us, when we look at it, we're thinking, you know, Christ gave of himself, and he died on the cross for our sins, and we had the nails in his hands, and the nails in the street, and all, all, all that's great. Uh, but consider the daily suffering uh, of Christ. Consider the demand of uh, the hardship that he had to go through just on a daily basis. He's, uh, Jesus is teaching all day long, and then after he's finished teaching, then uh, uh, you've got a line full of people who show up because they want to be healed, 
uh, by him. That's interesting. And after he, you know, that uh, they show sure want to be healed, and then after he says that, he goes to dinner. And then uh, he's invited to eat at somebody's house, and when he sits down, now they want private counseling sessions uh, with him. They want <laughs> private Bible studies uh, with him, and, he, and he's just trying to see, y'all. He's just, that's all. He just wants to eat. But another, uh, geez, I read, you know. Uh, and then not, not only are they uh, wanting private Bible studies with him, they're, they're trying to challenge him and even on some of the teachings uh, that he had. Even his own disciples. Uh, wouldn't give him a moment's rest. Because uh, he's in, in a, a place of repose, and, and they're saying stuff like, no, uh, Jesus, no, who, who's the greatest in the kingdom? You know, <laughs> they're asking questions like, you know, or saying something like, when you, when you get in your king, can I say it's your right hand? And, uh, hey, well, let me say your left hand then. You know, he's going to all of those. He has to have a moment to pray. He needs to have a moment to sleep. Think about it. He's on board the boat trying to sleep. And he has, he's in good hands. He should have been. These guys are, are expert fishermen. Uh, they have been out there on, on boats numerous times. A storm uh, breaks out, and they're waking him up saying, uh, remember again, by occupation, Jesus is a carpenter. Okay? He is a carpenter. He was not a fisherman. He was a carpenter. And so here are uh, these uh, these fishermen who are used to be out there on the water understanding storms, waking Jesus up from his sleep, you know, to deal with the storm. Uh, 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 but you know, I'm saying it from the point of, of his humanity. Uh, consider that, you know, there are times where you just want to rest. And you naturally, uh, just, you don't feel like this thing always being bothered uh, all the time. You know, sometimes you just want to, you just want to sit back and, you know, and, and kind of kick up your heels. You know, and you don't want to, uh, am, am I talking the right heels? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes you, you just want a moment to say, you know, hey, you know, I, I really just came to watch the game. That's all. You know? I, didn't, I, I didn't come down with Bible, Bible suggestion with you. I just want to watch the game uh, right now. My, my point is, uh, with Jesus, um, there's this pressure that's on him uh, that was continually, and uh, he had moments of fatigue. He just got tired, y'all. Uh, uh, he got uh, weary uh, in his fleshly body, but he gives us a pattern. He shows us an example for us to follow, and that's uh, that while we are serving, we'll often have hardship, but don't allow the hardship to hamper our ability to be able to reach and assist other people, that we're supposed to complete the work, we're supposed to help extend, we're supposed to help people to be able to grow. So the Lord Jesus Christ expects every servant leader to suffer for the church, to complete the church, uh, to bring it to its full measure, to, to fill it up to its will, to build it up to the stature of the fullness uh, of Christ. Uh, Christ expects us to do whatever is necessary, hallelujah, to build the church up. Go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians, the, the, the ninth chapter. Uh, he expects for us to do whatever uh, it takes uh, to build uh, one another. As a matter of fact, our job is, is supposed to build one another up, and we're not supposed to spend our time trying to tear one another down. Uh, we're supposed to be edifying one another. We're supposed to be uh, building e each other uh, up. Uh, 1 Corinthians in the ninth, ninth chapter, uh, verse uh, 19 is where we're going to start, and we'll go to uh, verse 23. It says something uh, like this. For though I am uh, free from all, I have made myself servant to all, that I might win more uh, of them. And I love that. So Paul is saying, I'm free from everybody. But I've turned around that I've made myself a servant to everyone. Why? That I might be able to win more of them. So the Jew, I became a Jew in order to win the Jew. And those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of, of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. And I love this part here. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Why? Uh, to, uh, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. So uh, I become all things uh, to all men 
that I might be able uh, to save some. Uh, that by any means, that by, that by any means, I might be able uh, to save some. Uh, and I'm doing it, he says. I do it for the gospel. I, I, I do it that I might be able to share in his blessings along with the others uh, in sharing the gospel. So we are to go to great lengths to be able to help someone uh, and to be built up uh, in the gospel. So uh, do me a favor, please. Uh, we'll put this out, out in, the, in the atmosphere. If you have to be, I am responsible, I am responsible to build up others, to build up others for, Christ. for Christ. I am responsible to build up others for Christ. Trina, that was uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, the ninth chapter, uh, verse 19 through 23. Again, that's 1 Corinthians, ninth chapter, verse uh, 19 through uh, 23. Let's go to verse uh, 25, Colossians chapter 1. Of which I, I became a minister according to the stewardship uh, from God that was given to me for you uh, to make the word of God fully known. Uh, the church needs uh, steward uh, um, or servant leaders who have been called and chosen by the Lord to be a minister. Uh, the church needs servant leaders who have been called and chosen by the Lord to be a minister. Now, when I'm using and I'm saying the word uh, minister, I'm using it in the, uh, in, in the original sense uh, that the word minister was used in, in etymology, uh, not the creation that we have become uh, in, in our church. Uh, so we'll have to take antics. Uh, in, the, in the church world, we have an idea of what minister is, which is a far cry uh, from the original intent uh, that the word minister uh, is supposed to be. So when I'm saying minister, I'm referring to the original idea that God has uh, for the church in terms uh, of ministry. And so uh, that word for, for minister, diakonos, uh, literally means attendant or, or waiter. Attendant or waiter. So think of it in one of two ways. Think of it like you are, um, there's someone who's inhibited and uh, they, they, they can't uh, be as mobile or, or tend to like things as much as they would like. So they hire in an attendant, uh, someone to help them uh, assist them in life, uh, to make sure that their needs are being met, to make sure things are, are being done and attended. Uh, then there is and another way for attendant, there's, there's one aspect of it. Uh, then there is the idea of a waiter. Uh, think of a, a restaurant and you're going, you're out to eat. And there is uh, the waiter, waitress. Uh, they are, are uh, to attend to uh, your table, and they should be making sure that you're having the most pleasurable eating experience uh, that's possible. Now, for me, uh, I love, oh my goodness, I, I love an attentive uh, waiter or, or, or waitress that's, that's looking out for my need before I have to make the need uh, known. Uh, you're talking about your gratuity will go, will go up. Uh, when I see that you actually care about, and, and you're paying attention to my need before I actually can have to tell you uh, about my need. You know, if you're watching out for my glass to make sure you know, I've got something else, I, uh, you, you're making sure I've got something to drink and I have to, keep, uh, to tell you several times you know, to give me something to drink, or then I, oh, you're paying attention. And, and I, know, I, I know, I really know that there are other people out there in the restaurant eating besides me. I really do. <laughs> Uh, but you know, it's just that, that special attention uh, that waiter pays, it, and, and you uh, probably you and I as well. But, and when there's a, a waiter that's not paying attention uh, as they should, but they're expecting your uh, gratuity, but mm -hmm. I'm always uh, puzzled, you know, by uh, a, a waiter who will come by and, and uh, they'll leave the receipt uh, on the table, but they'll circle, you know, the, the percentage of the of gratuity uh, that they're expecting. Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, dude, you wouldn't even have my table. Uh, <laughs> how do you expect for me to? Give me this, and then you, I saw you when you came to take the order. I saw you when you brought the food, and I saw you when you brought the check. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> My point is, uh, we are called. We're called to be uh, uh, attendants. We're called to be uh, 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 waiters. We're called to be uh, servants. So the people of God, uh, we are. We're supposed to be servants of God, servants of His church, and servants of the people. When I say people, I'm not referring to uh, the people of God, per se. I'm referring to the people in general, as in people in, in the world. 
were supposed to be servants of God, servants of his church, and servants of, of the people. Please repeat uh, these words uh, after me. I am, I am a servant, a servant of, God, of God, his church, his church and the people. And the people. Yeah, that is our responsibility. We're supposed to serve God. We're supposed to uh, serve his church. We're supposed to serve uh, the, the people uh, in, in the world. Uh, one of the occasions where, where the, the, the disciples were, you know, here they are, uh, and, and, and Jesus is getting rest. <laughs> uh, they break into a conversation about who's the greatest. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. At the same time, the disciples came to Jesus and they're saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? Jesus uh, called a little child unto him. Consider that. He called a little child to him, and he set the child in the midst uh, of them. He says this, whoever therefore uh, shall humble himself as his little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom uh, of heaven. Consider what happened. When uh, here is Jesus, and they, uh, they want to know who's the greatest in the kingdom. And so, to show the greatest in the kingdom, Jesus calls a child. So, to call the child, and the child respond, we see obedience. The child obeyed the Lord in coming and responded to him to, to coming. To, at, but, and Jesus gave the call, the child comes, obedience. The child then uh, surrendered to what Jesus was saying uh, and submitted to what Jesus asked him to do. Uh, Jesus, and the text shows, he set the child uh, in the midst. So he beckoned the child to come, the child came. The child had to surrender his will to accept the will of what Jesus said, and then uh, the child had to uh, submit to what Jesus wanted him to do and to stand where Jesus wanted him to stand. Again, my point is, when it comes to the kingdom of God, uh, your three words that you must get is uh, surrender, submission, obey. Those are the three words for the kingdom of God. Surrender, submission, obey. Uh, that child showed us that, and Jesus said, uh, greatness is determined by your submission, by your surrender, and by your obedience. And so, you're not really great if you can't surrender. You're not really great if you can't submit, and you're not really great if you cannot obey. In the 20th, 23rd chapter of Matthew, verse 11, uh, Jesus said, but he that's the greatest among you shall be your servant. So, greatness is not determined by those who are serving you. Greatness is determined by uh, how you are uh, serving others. We are servants of God, servants of his church, and servants of uh, the people. In um, Luke 22, verse 26, he's kind of summing up what was said in Matthew 18 and Matthew 23. He says, the greatest among you uh, become, the greatest among you uh, become as the youngest and the leader as one uh, who serves. So greatness is determined uh, by your service uh, and also by your submission. Leaders uh, should be serving uh, leaders. Uh, the reality is servants eat last. So if the, the leader is the greatest, then the leader should be eating Last, so uh, uh, we we we've got some things that kind of uh, 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 out of place uh, uh, in many ways because, especially in, in, in our churches, we we have. And, and please don't take this in, in the indictment against anyone. I love and appreciate all of you. God bless you. You know, we have these head tables set up, and we have, we have people that they they will rise and if you, as the, uh, the leader comes in and sits down, and then you know, the leader sits down, and everybody else sits down after them, and, and no one eats the leader eats. Like, are you kidding me? You know, uh, the scripture says that he that's the greatest should be the servant of, of all. The servant of all. I've, I've gone to places. I've gone to places. Honestly. You know, and um, they're going to have a dinner uh, set up, and, and I'm with the pastor. The pastor calls and says, we're, we're running about 30 minutes behind. Uh, and and uh, hold the food up until we get there. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. People are sitting there for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's just me. I mean, feed the people. You know, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not resistant. I'm like, feed the people. Let them be happy. They'll appreciate you when you come walking in because they got a chance to eat, right. and, and the food's not cold by the time uh, we got there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. You know, the, he does the grace of God, he's going to be the servant uh, of all. 
And so it's really important for us to display uh, that, that servant type uh, of leadership. Let's go further. Verse 25 and 26. Uh, King James. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to, uh, to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, uh, and that now is made manifest to uh, his saints. Go ahead and please turn with me to Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Um, servant leaders are required to be stewards of the mysteries of God. Servant leaders are required to be uh, uh, stewards of the mysteries of God. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1 and 2 says, tells us that a man uh, so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Uh, stewards should be Faithful. So, Lord, uh, let's let's uh, make this a, a simple prayer. If you have to be, Lord, Lord, help me, help help me, me to be faithful. To be faithful. Let's do it one more time. Say, Lord, 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 help me, help me, me to be faithful. To be faithful. Yeah. So, stewards are supposed to be uh, faithful. It's required of stewards to be faithful. Now, we've we dealt with stewardship uh, before, uh, but it just kind of merits just uh, mentioning as we go into this this moment. A steward is. Uh, one who is an administrator or who serves the economy of another. Literally, a steward oversees the property or the household of someone else. It is not their own, but it's someone else's property. So then, as a believer, we are called to be stewards over God's house and over God's property. We're called to be stewards over the house of God and over the property of God. What's God's property? Psalm 24 says, the earth is the, Lord. the Lord's. And so uh, it's not just the house of God that we're supposed to be stewards over. We're supposed to be stewards over all of, of God's property. So therefore, in the sacredness of ministry, but also in the marketplace as well, we're supposed to be stewards over uh, the house of God. It is almost unbelievable to think that the God of all the earth and the universe would trust uh, his property and his house with people like us. You know, to think that God would say, uh, I'm going to put you in charge of that which belongs to me. Psalm 8 tells us that all the creation, you know, uh, he put under man's uh, feet. You no know, one of the psalmists says, well, what is man? You know, that you're, uh, who am I? That you would even, uh, you're mindful of me, that you would, you would make uh, me. And so uh, the servant leader has been chosen by God to be a steward over uh, the house of God, uh, the world, and also over uh, the people. Additionally, we're supposed to be stewards over uh, the word of God to make sure that the word of God is fully known uh, unto others. Here's the issue in Colossians. The Colossians, um, they struggle with the idea of the word fullness because they believed uh, being aristocratic themselves, uh, very affluent, highly cultured, highly educated people with the Stoic and, and Epicurean philosophies that were helping them. Here they are, and they're thinking to themselves, you know, that we have, by our philosophical bent and also our mystical experiences, we know what fullness is about. And Paul says, well, no, uh, you're, you're, you're knowing it in, in a portion. There's more than you really know. But Christ has revealed what was a mystery. He has made it known to uh, his saints. But that which was concealed is now been revealed uh, to his people. The church, uh, brothers and sisters, was uh, seemingly hidden uh, years before, but now made known in this last day. Pastor, what do you mean by that? I mean this. Uh, in the Old Testament, although Acts 7.38 says that Israel was God's church in the wilderness, uh, the church was not made known in its fullness because the church is the body of Christ. So it could not be made known prior to the cross. It could only be made known after the cross. And so then Christ would pour out of his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Remember the first Pentecost is Exodus 19th chapter. Uh, the church 
uh, the Pentecost of the church adheres to is Acts chapter 2. And so on the day of Pentecost, uh, the now the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place, the church becomes alive and, and quite uh, vibrant. And so Pentecost is the birthday of the church. This Sunday, around the world, thank you Jesus, we'll be celebrating uh, Pentecost. Uh, it's a birthday party, y'all. Uh, and so we should be celebrating the birth uh, of the church and how Christ brought the church into the fullness of, of manifestation. Uh, so it's been revealed now. The mystery is that through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, that now both the Jew and the Gentile has been brought to the same level. Here's the problem. In the 10th chapter of Acts, you've got uh, the uh, uh, Peter, who is, uh, he's fell asleep, but he's hungry, and they're busy preparing food. While he's uh, sleeping, hungry, y'all, God uses his hunger to teach him a lesson. <laughs> and uh, so he, he falls, and, he, and he's dreaming about this, this blanket that comes out, has all kinds of beats that are on there. And the Lord tells him, rise, Peter, you know, uh, kill and eat. And he's thinking, oh, Lord, <laughs> uh, I don't eat, I've never eaten eat anything uh, that's unclean. Uh, and the Lord says, don't you call something unclean that I've called clean. Uh, he's using this moment to share with him that you have had a lesser view of the Gentiles. Hallelujah. Uh, and uh, so that you view them in a lesser way, I need to go to Cornelius' house. And I want you to preach to them. Uh, see what happens. And we rejoice that when Peter got there, he's preaching, and the Holy Ghost fell while he's preaching. Uh, and, we think, and we oh my goodness, uh, uh, the, it can happen while you're preaching, the Holy Ghost falls. Yes, but please understand why. God had to bypass Peter uh, in his interaction with them because uh, previously Peter laid hands on people. But because Peter thought less of the Gentile, it had to happen while he was preaching. Yes. Had to happen while he was preaching. Uh, and even when Peter saw this, uh, now they're, they, uh, they, and he says, they have received, what's the word? They have received the Holy Ghost just like we have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what stops him from being uh, baptized? You know? And so uh, we be like, oh, he's, brothers and sisters, he's still struggling with the idea of this prejudice. How do we know? Later on, he gets to Antioch, and he's hanging out with the Gentiles there. There's no Jews uh, there hanging out and, and watching him, not, not those who are, are like him. So when those Jews like him came from Jerusalem, and Peter now was hanging with the Gentiles before, and now when uh, his boys, uh, she'll be like, you know what, excuse me. <laughs> Paul, Paul's like, no, 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 uh, bro. <laughs> When they were here, you were eating just like we were. You were hanging out uh, with us. Now when they show up, uh, you want to pretend like you have no idea. You don't touch them. They don't touch you. Because in, in their minds, that the Gentiles, even though saved, were still lesser. And Paul says, what Christ did, Christ brought the Jew and the Gentile on the same level. Can I tell you this? Don't you dare get caught today in this falsified teaching. Uh, I love you all dearly, so please don't take this the wrong way when I say it. But there are those who adhere to uh, uh, black Israelites, and they're showing that, that blacks are superior. Transatlantic blacks have come over uh, on board the ship, and so now somehow they uh, hear me. The gospel shows that the Jew and Gentile have been made one on the same level. So what does it matter? <laughs> You know, what does it, and there's a whole lot of issues that come up with that because now we gotta, we gotta trace DNA to actually prove, uh, and we gotta, we gotta deal blood samples, and we gotta find the blood samples of those who can't. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So just, just because somebody said it doesn't mean it's actually real. Oh. That's the heart of the day. Uh, I don't have time to do that right now, but it's just, it's, it's, it really amazes me. The Jew and the Gentile have been made on the same level uh, with Christ. So now, uh, uh, we have the, the same union. Uh, with Christ, which brings me now to uh, Ephesians, the, the, the second chapter. You guys are already? Uh, verse 19 is what we want to pick up. Ephesians chapter 2, verse uh, 19. <clears throat> Glory to God. Mm. Hallelujah. They're asking for my spaghetti uh, on <laughs> the ears. God bless the saints. Just <laughs> please, <laughs> 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 one spaghetti. Yes, Lord. Uh, let's start at verse 18, though, instead of verse 19. This is, this is the, uh, 
Ephesians 2, verse 18. Um, for, for through him, we both have access, Jew and Gentile, uh, in one spirit to the Father. So then, uh, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the, the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple. Now that's interesting. The temple is growing. Now that's amazing. In whom, or in him, uh, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by uh, the Spirit. Uh, the mystery that Paul says that we have been given stewardship over is that the church, brothers and sisters, is the new nation of God. The church is the new nation of God. That through Israel, before, God was making his name known. But being the firstborn son of God, uh, Israel decides uh, to squander uh, the opportunity. Uh, and so therefore the Lord uses the church now as a, the new nation with which uh, he would demonstrate his power, uh, his kingdom, or even his name uh, through. And we are, as Paul says, we're fellow citizens of this uh, nation of God. It's extraordinary. So then, as a fellow citizen, which means we're, we are natives from the same town, from the same uh, country, we have, uh, we receive the rights and the privileges of being a part of, of this kingdom. It's really extraordinary. As a, a citizen, the rights that you have, uh, there are privileges uh, that you have. Being a citizen of the United States, the there rights that you have as an American citizen, oftentimes uh, we don't uh, utilize them to the fullest extent, but there are the rights that you have uh, being a citizen of, of the United States. And even when you're in a foreign country uh, and you're in the trouble, uh, you have the, the right to get to the, the embassy. Uh, and if you can get there, uh, you'll find a solemn uh, that, that's there. And there's a, a right that you have as a citizen, even though in another country, if there's an, an embassy that's there, you can get on, on, on American uh, soil. Glory to God. Uh, that we are, brothers and sisters, uh, are citizens of the kingdom of God. What rights do you have as a citizen of this new nation? And what rights are in uh, this? What, what privileges belong to you? I need you to know the kingdom of God offers a health care system. You got to know that. There's a health care system in the kingdom of God. And you have a right to access this health care system in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has a, a, an economy that is always increasing. The, 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 the economy of the kingdom of God never fails. Uh, it never goes down. It is an ever-increasing economy. Uh, in this uh, a kingdom of God, as a system of reciprocity, whatever you sow, uh, you get a chance uh, to reap. God's kingdom uh, has an educational system, there's a transportation system, there's a legislative system, there's a judicial system. It's just, uh, all these are there uh, in the kingdom of God, and you get a chance to partake uh, of that. There's righteousness, there's joy, there's peace, all of them in, in the Holy Spirit. So therefore, as a citizen of the kingdom of God, it is my right to be healed. Hallelujah. I have a right to be healed. It's my, I don't, and please get this, I don't have to beg for healing as a citizen of the kingdom of God. I don't have to beg for deliverance. Glory to God. Because as a citizen of, of God's kingdom, deliverance is a part of my citizenship. Come on. Uh, as a, a citizen of the kingdom, liberty is mine. I don't have to beg for, for God to liberate me. I'm, I'm supposed to be liberated because I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. Peace is my, I don't have to beg uh, for peace. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of, of God. Uh, and keep in mind with the story of Paul, remember when he was being persecuted, uh, it was interesting that he found a moment where uh, the uh, guy was beating him and, and, he, and Paul cries, I'm, I'm a Roman citizen. And the guy says, oh, is that, are you going to beat someone with a Roman citizen? And then uh, the guy says, well, uh, no, I didn't know you were a Roman citizen. How much did you pay? I, I paid every price. Paul said, I was born. I was born a Roman citizen. I need you to know, you didn't pay a, a single dime 
for citizenship of the kingdom of God. You were born a citizen of the kingdom of God. I love that. By being born again, you were born a citizen of the kingdom of God. Therefore, there are rights that you were born into. Have you used your rights? Uh, have you, uh, have you uh, found out the privileges that you have as a citizen of the kingdom of God? Not just that. Uh, you also, one of the other mysteries is the family of God. The church is the family of God. You have a new name, or better yet, you have a new last name. Uh, uh, it's amazing for many of us. You know, we, we so appreciate being you know, uh, who you are. So, you know, if you are, uh, uh, whatever you are, if you're a Jones, or you're, if you're a Smith, or you're an Anderson, whatever, if you're a Turner, you know, you, you take great pride, you take great pride, you know, in, in the name uh, uh, that you have. But the reality is, your name uh, does nothing to demons. <laughs> demons. <laughs> Demons don't run because they hear your last name. They do nothing. You know, uh, uh, bodies aren't healed when they hear your uh, last name, but there's something about the name Jesus that's extraordinary. Uh, you know, uh, we sang it years ago uh, in, in, in churches. You know, tell me who can stand before us when we call on that great name. Jesus, Jesus, you know, uh, the old saints used to say, you can't say his name too many times and something might happen, you know, on, on, on the inside. As a little child, and I, I heard him say that, I don't know what they were talking about, you know, but, but I found later on, when you have relationship uh, with God and you start saying, Jesus, you know, something happens uh, inside. There is, uh, you have a family name that carries weight, glory to God, in, in the kingdom of God. When you start saying, you know, uh, what the demon asked you, what family did you come from? Jesus. You know? <laughs> and you say, and then he's bothering you, and then, but in the name of, of Jesus. How can you, what gives you the right? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a child of God. I'm a, I'm a part of the family of God. Therefore, I have the right to use the name. Hallelujah. And so, one of the mysteries is that we are supposed to be good stewards over is that the church is the family uh, of God. Uh, also, another mystery is the church is uh, the building of God. Not just any kind of building. The church is a lot, it's a living building. Uh, it's a, a living organism that the church uh, is building itself up daily. It's extraordinary to see it. Uh, it's, a, it's a building that is uh, uh, that's alive. So, uh, hallelujah. You know, uh, it's, it's alive. So for my sci-fi people, you know, you have uh, these uh, uh, a live house or an active house. Today we have uh, smart houses, you know, and, and your house will respond uh, to you. Come on, you know. <laughs> the house responds uh, to you. You tell it, you know, whatever you call your house, lights off and the lights turn off or uh, the lights on. Or you can be, you can be here today right in this room and decide you know, when I get home I want, I want the house uh, at a certain temperature and you're, and you're on your phone and you uh, hit the uh, controls to make sure that the, the, the lights turn on or the air comes on because you want to walk into a cool it, it, it's amazing the church is a living uh, building that keeps building itself up it does not decay it keeps increasing Christ is the cornerstone he's the guidestone He's the instructional stone uh, for us. He's the sure foundation. The church is also uh, the temple of God. And the goal of the Old Testament temple was to house the presence of God and the glory of God. And the goal of the New Testament temple is to house and to uh, inhabit the glory of God. The goal of this temple of God is to house the glory of God and the presence of God. I mm -hmm. repeat these words after me in this prayer. Lord, Lord help, me help me to be a carrier, be a carrier of your glory, and your, your glory. And, your and your presence. In your presence. But we want to be a carrier of the glory of God and the presence of God. You are God's mobile temple in the earth. Hallelujah. You're his habitation. And he loves and he wants to dwell with you. Verse 27, 25 to 27 in ID. I have become his servant 
by commission by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mission that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, uh, but is now disclosed to the saints. Uh, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. What is it? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Um, so the, the church needs servant leaders who understand and will make known this mystery to the saints. Not just the mystery about the church, but uh, to understand that God has chosen to make this known. And he has uh, willed, uh, with his eternal purpose, that you and I would have his glorious riches. Uh, we were once far off. We had no hope. We were without Christ. But now we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. That is to say, that the believers are indwelt by Christ, who is the hope of glory. Meaning then, that we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. The church needs servant leaders who will share the mystery of the divine indwelling. The church needs servant leaders who will share the mystery of the divine indwelling. It is the mystery of the new birth. It is the union of the divine nature with the human nature. Brothers and sisters, think of it like this. In the same way that Jesus, who was divine, became a man, then we, uh, who are natural, must become divine. So Christ was divine, and he became uh, a man, uh, natural. We must become, or we were born or made natural, we must become uh, divine. It is a wonderful union. The mystery of this union is uh, the union of identity. That is Christ alive in us. Christ alive uh, in us. This is the mystery of the indwelling Christ. That is to say, the Holy Spirit living in us is the personal presence of Christ in us. I'll say it once again because it's extremely important to get. The Holy Spirit in us is the personal presence of Christ in us. The Holy Spirit is not another being. The Holy Spirit is not another person. The Holy Spirit is not another God. The Holy Spirit is the personal presence of Christ living or tabernacling inside of us. So in John, the 14th chapter, verse 16 through 18, when Jesus was talking about leaving his disciples, he said, uh, uh, I'm going I'm to leave you, but the Father goes in a, a comfort of you. Now they're thinking, well, somebody else is coming. Uh, but then Jesus says, uh, but I will come to you, and I will live in you, letting them know that in case you're wondering who the comforter is, I am the comforter. In case you're wondering who the Holy Spirit is, I am the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is the promised Holy Spirit. It is his personal presence. Glory to God. His personal presence. So uh, the presence of Jesus is a living, eternal, and if I can add this in there, uh, an ever-increasing presence. So the Holy Spirit is a, the living presence of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the eternal presence of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the ever-increasing presence of Jesus. I'll give it to you once again, uh, because that, that last one I added in for you. The Holy Spirit is the living presence of Jesus, which means it is an active presence. The Holy Spirit is alive uh, in you. It doesn't show up one time, and then it's over. Hallelujah to God. Uh, I'll give it to you like, like this. Uh, if your child, your grandchild, your godchild, your niece, your nephew, if you heard them speak one time, and they never spoke again after that, are you going to be concerned? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you heard them speak once, and they never, ever spoke again, you're going to be concerned. You're going to say to yourself, something wrong. Because that, hallelujah, that's not normal. Right? That's not normal. First, that's the spiritual. That means this thing. Glory to God. If the Holy Spirit is an active, the active living presence of God, God does not come 
and speak one time through you. Because if you speak once, and you've only spoken once, and you've never spoken again, something's wrong. Glory to God. Because the Holy Spirit is the, an active, a living presence. Okay? An active, living presence. The Holy Spirit is the eternal presence of Christ. Uh, which means in Christ living in us, uh, the eternal presence is Christ is eternal and he lives inside of us. We become eternal. So the believer never dies because of what Christ uh, now they understand to live uh, eternally with uh, our Savior. But also, also, the Holy Spirit is uh, the ever-increasing presence of God, or the Lord Jesus Christ, the ever-increasing presence, which means then that the more uh, Christ lives in you, uh, the more uh, he takes over in you. You're being changed moment by moment. As a matter of fact, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us uh, in the air in atomos, or as molecule by molecule, daily, daily, Christ is taking over you. Christ should be daily growing inside you. All right? Let me put it like this. If you've been saved <laughs> for 20 years, mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't see much of you uh, anymore because Christ should be grown inside you. Mm -hmm. Is that similar enough? Yes. <laughs> if you've been saved for 30, 40 years, we shouldn't see you at all <laughs> anymore because Christ should be fully grown. Uh, inside you. So as long as you're still uh, coming out, and as obviously you have stunted the growth, did I say that? Uh, you have, you've stunted the growth of the Holy Spirit. You don't allow the Holy Spirit to grow uh, like it's, uh, it's supposed to in your life because the Holy Spirit should be growing, ever increasing in your life. There should be more of God in you uh, than there was last year. There should be more Holy Spirit in you this year than there was last year. Christ should have more control over your life this year than he did uh, last year. Now, we sang the song years ago, I feel God stretching out in me. That's what we said, you know. And then uh, uh, the, the song got real good and he said, I, I cleaned up my house. That's what he said. And I, I kicked the devil out. <laughs> You know, I, I can remember uh, we were in church and we went, and uh, uh, you, you've seen that song, people, people like this, their foot's going out. <laughs> they, they keep the, the, the devil out, you know. Uh, but the reality is, uh, if you're still as mad as you were uh, last year, you have not allowed Christ to grow in you. If you still have the same hang-ups you did last year, Christ has not grown uh, in you. Because the Holy Spirit is the ever-increasing presence of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in uh, your life. Let me then help you. Tomorrow's a fast day <laughs> uh, for all of us. We fast tomorrow from midnight to 4 p.m. So just in case you are struggling, you know, but cleaning your house, and, and the devil's been, he's been there too long, and you've been, you've been talking, and you ain't kicked him out yet, uh, you get a chance to do some house cleaning on, on tomorrow. We fast, by the way, tomorrow from midnight uh, to 4 p.m. So do some house cleaning on, on tomorrow. Get ready for the birthday party on Sunday. Uh, it's a, uh, the, it's, the church is celebrating it, it, its birth. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so then, uh, when Christ lives uh, on, on the inside uh, of us, uh, then uh, he imparts abundant life. He imparts uh, eternal life uh, for us. Uh, and so uh, the uh, Holy Spirit is supposed to be living, ever-growing uh, in us, and we experience the abundant life. We experience the eternal life uh, of Christ. Uh, this is a mutual uh, uh, union. Christ in us and you uh, in Christ. A mutual union uh, between uh, the two. It is the hope of a believer. It's the hope of glory. It's a guarantee of the inheritance that we have uh, as the saints. Two more verses, and we're done very quickly. Verse uh, 28, this is the message Bible. It says, we preach Christ, warning people not to add to the message. We teach in a spirit of profound common sense so that we can uh, bring each person to maturity. Uh, well, look at these words up there. To be mature is to be basic. Yeah. Do y'all see yeah. that? Mm -hmm. To be mature is to be basic. Christ, no more, no less. What are you saying, Pastor? When you become mature in Christ, you are not doing something extraordinary. You're supposed to mature in Christ. Think about it. With your children, 
your, your grandchildren, your godchild, your niece, your nephew. You expect them to grow and to become mature. And when they don't mature like you want them to or fast enough, you get frustrated, right? The same way with us as believers, uh, we should come into maturity and you're, uh, we should be passing out plaques to you because you grew up in Christ. <laughs> you're supposed to grow up in Christ. That makes sense to you. And the reality is you're supposed to help somebody else grow uh, in, in Christ. So the church needs uh, servant leaders who will preach Christ, who will warn and teach uh, others. Uh, 2 Timothy 4 and 2 uh, states that preach the word uh, be into the instance of the season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering uh, and doctrine. Uh, I'll tell you guys uh, this, as I told you uh, uh, all day today. Um, when I was 12, I was 12 years old, I was called to preach at 12. Uh, it was on a, uh, a week day revival. My grandmother was preaching uh, on that night, and in church I had a vision uh, of myself preaching. Uh, it wasn't the church that we were at at the time, it was another church which I had not been yet built. Uh, later on, I found it was the church that was in Marion, Virginia. Uh, I saw myself preaching. And when I came out of the vision, my Bible is open to 2 Timothy 4 and 2. And I'm reading as a 12 year old, preach the word, uh, being in, some, in season, uh, out of season. And I said to God in that moment, what does this mean? I heard, I heard the Lord respond to being saved. When you're on the way home in the car, ask your father. And so I said, oh, I'm, I'm in church, my grandmother's preaching, I hear this, I'm like, okay. We get in the car, we're on the ship springs road, we're going on the way home. And I said to dad, Something happened to me in church. He said, what's that? So I told him about the vision I had and how the scripture, the Bible was open to 2 Timothy 4 and 2. And I read to him in the, in the car on the way home uh, the, the scripture said. I said, and, I, and then I said, what does this mean? And I heard the Lord say to ask you on the way home. So I'm asking you. He looked over me as he dropped and said, well, son, it looks like the Lord's calling you to preach. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> First of all, I'm 12. <laughs> Leave us in the back seat going, Yes! Yes! <laughs> I called the priest. I'm like, no, what, what's going on? Uh, we get in the house. My mom didn't go to that night because of uh, Lanika. I tell wasn't born yet. Uh, Lanika was, was sick that day. She didn't go, didn't go to the service. We get home. Levi races in the house and he's saying, like, Mom, Mom, God called him out to preach. I'm like, well, first of all, let me tell my own story. <laughs> I don't know why we want this story to be told. So that, yeah. that's my story as, as how I was called uh, to preach. Uh, and we're supposed to uh, preach Christ. Him crucified. The reality is this, brothers and sisters, if you preach the word, the word will do the work. The word will do the work. You don't have to worry about trying to put people in their place. The word will do the work. The word knows how to convict people. You don't have to worry about that. You know, you don't have to be angry and preach sin. Hallelujah. The word will do the work. Uh, the Word has a way of... There are times you're reading your Bible and the Word is convicting you and, and you know you're wrong. And you, and you're, the Word knows how uh, to do uh, the appropriate work. We were in, in Cambridge on Sunday at the church one of the saints walked up to me and said, Pastor, well, were you in the car? Did you overhear my conversation? Like, no. Uh, what happened? The Word knows where to find you. The Word knows how to, uh, to speak to you. The Word knows how to uh, convict you. Uh, and so for us as believers, uh, we got to make sure that we, that we utilize the Word of God with great patience and careful instruction. Now, consider, if the Word is, is to rebuke and, and to correct, that means when we correct, we got to, we got to bring careful instruction. That's a, there's nothing worse than a prophet that wants to expose someone for their sin, but doesn't follow uh, uh, it up with careful instruction. That word careful instruction actually means gentle. Oh, that's powerful. Which means then, that if we're going to correct someone prophetically, then we have to give them instructions on how to return. Does that make sense? Because we've killed a lot of people uh, in our best, our efforts in, uh, I've got a hard ministry. And God, God, and there's no such thing as a hard ministry. They're just mean people that's preaching. That's all it is. That's all it is. You got mean people who preach and they're angry. <laughs> and when they're preaching, that anger comes out while, while they're preaching. You know, and here's my point. You can say, you know, uh, God's going to come back for all of you sinners if you don't change your life. Or you can say, God's going to come back for you, all sinners. If you don't change your life, God's going to judge you. 
Same message, just used a different way. Yeah, now get this. If you grew up in a hostile environment, someone preaching to you angrily convicts you. But if you grew up in, in, a, in, a, in a, an environment where hostility was not the norm, someone preaching to you angrily, you're like, wait a minute, what's, what is this? Mm-hmm. But if, if they start talking to you in a way that you're familiar, it's going to, does that make sense to you? Mm-hmm. It's going to start convicting you. Right? So what we often call hard ministry is this people's personalities coming through their ministry. God help us. God help us. God help us. The word knows how to do the work. Check your attitude. The word knows how to do uh, the work. Here's our last verse, verse 29, and we're finished. That's why I'm, I'm working so hard at, at day after day, year after year, doing my best with the energy God so generously gives me. Um, the church needs servant leaders who will labor and strive to serve God uh, and his, his people. Labor <coughs> indicates to work hard, to feel fatigue. Um, strive means to struggle, to compete for the prize, to contend with an adversary, to endeavor to accomplish something. The idea is that of, a, of an athlete who is speaking like my warriors are trying to do. Uh, they're trying to go for the championship, and the boys are pushing. <laughs> Uh, and God bless the warriors for a three P in Jesus' name. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's the point, uh, and I say it can be, but the, the reality is, um, they're out there, and athletes know that if they're going to be able to excel, much of what they have to do is going to, is going to be repeated over and over again, and they're going to repeat it over and over again, and they're going to find ways to do better at what they're doing by repeating what they're doing, finding ways to improve themselves. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to the child of God and serving the Lord, you've got to push yourself beyond your capacity. And you'll find yourself doing the same thing over and over again and over and over again. Don't be frustrated by that. Find ways to improve it so you become more efficient because the Bible lets us know. Paul says that Christ will work in, he was working in me. Christ was giving me energy. In other words, Paul was saying, as I kept doing the same thing over and over again, Jesus made me more efficient. He made me actively efficient. And my point is, if you keep finding yourself doing it over and, and, and keep putting yourself into it and pouring yourself into it, Christ will make you efficient. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Therefore, my beloved brother, be steadfast. That means stand your ground and movable. Be established. My favorite part here is always abounding in the work of the Lord. That means ever moving upward, ever increasing, always conquering. Don't just be, don't just be steadfast. Don't just be immovable. Keep increasing. Keep going up, upward. Keep conquering. Refuse to be uh, defeated. Knowing if you keep pushing the limits and you keep going further, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If you keep stretching yourself, you keep giving it your, your all, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, the point of the lesson today is that we're supposed to be servants of all. That's our job. Serve God. Serve his church and serve the people. Um, before we pray um, uh, our final prayer, just repeat uh, this after me. This is a little short prayer. Lord, Lord help, me help me to be a better servant, to be a better servant, servant of your church, of your church, church and your people. Thank you, people. Let's pray. Father, thank you today. You're absolutely amazing. We, we, we look at the text, and, and as we go through this lesson, we're reminded, Lord, that we have not been the best servant leaders as we should have been. Forgive us, Lord, for that. We really could have improved it. And, and there, something happened along the way. I mean, we dare not, in this moment, try to give you an excuse as to why we were not giving it our all. For some of us, Lord, we, we remember days when we, 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 we really we, we gave it our best. We were, we were all in it. Something kind of deflated us. Forgive us, Lord, for that. We won't make excuses for that, Lord. 
of this Lord that never went to the starting blocks, never, never really came out the gates, but never really gave all for you. And so, Father, the day that they have been ignited with the, uh, passion and, and fire, saying, I'm going to give it my all. Father, there are those who are recommitting to you today. Lord, I pray, with whatever spectrum that we find ourselves, we just want to be better servant leaders for you. We want to be a nameless, faceless people. We're not in it for the, the title. We're not in it for the position. We're not in it for recognition. We just want your name to be glorified. We want to help others, Lord, to have the, the most impactful way for them to grow and for them to develop and for them to mature in you. So I thank you, Father, for another chance to serve you, to serve your church, and to serve your people. And in this moment, Lord, we recommit. We will give it our all. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's pray ourselves to the Lord in this time and to bring Him our offering. You really can the Lord's side of the offering. Just raise your hand for the next time you and this history while we are preparing uh, for uh, the, 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 the receiving of the tithes and the offering. We need the upcoming announcements. As a reminder, uh, we fast tomorrow from midnight to 4 p.m. Now, what are we doing tomorrow? Fast. <laughs> now we fast. Midnight to 4 p.m. Awesome. That's midnight to 4 p.m. tomorrow. This Sunday, it's Pentecost Sunday. It's the birthday of the church. It's the birthday party. And so let's come and celebrate the harvest of the Lord and to celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. On June 12th, it is Minister Alliance, 7 o'clock, uh, on site and also online. June 16th is Father's Day. We want to celebrate and honor and tell our appreciation to all these wonderful fathers. Uh, as I said before, that in the church world, Father's Day is the least attended service in the entire church world at all 52 Sundays. We want to change that time. Uh, and when we get out there, we want all men uh, show up for Father's Day, pass the word out. Uh, we are celebrating fathers on, on Father's Day here at Zion. We want them to feel welcome here and appreciated here. It's some fantastic, wonderful men, and we want to honor them on Father's Day. Uh, on the 19th of June is Senior Luncheon. Uh, see Brother Doug. On the 23rd is our leadership at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's a Sunday. Uh, we'll give you the updates at a quarterly meeting. That's where we are. And also marching orders going forward. On June the 30th is uh, our youth Sunday. And also the MOVE campaign has already begun. Uh, we encourage you to get out there. Uh, get moving. Uh, we'll, we'll be sponsoring hikes and walks and runs and bike rides. All that kind of stuff. Uh, so get out there. Uh, get moving. Uh, roll. If you have to crawl, uh, if you have to uh, do something, you know, scoop. If you have to <laughs> do something, get moving. It's gonna be an exciting time. Uh, and let's enjoy uh, the weather as it's breaking. Uh, additional reminders uh, to you: uh, on this Sunday, we're honoring all graduates. All graduates this Sunday, high school and college. And so, although we respect and we appreciate those who graduated from fifth grade <laughs> and eighth grade. <laughs> Uh, we're only honoring uh, high schoolers and college. So if you did graduate uh, from either of the two, please turn in your name and also uh, any honors that you received or what degrees you have. Uh, we want to celebrate you on um, this coming uh, Sunday. That's this Sunday. Uh, on June 30th, we're celebrating all honor of students. June the 30th. So kids get out on the, the, on the 18th. And so we'll honor uh, all honor of students on June 30th, which is our new Sunday. On June uh, 15th, June 15th, that's a Saturday, all youth workers were asking me to be here, and anyone who would like to work with the youth. It's a Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we'd like to work with all, all of our youth. We need to be marching orders to go forward. Uh, and so that's June uh, the 15th at 10 o'clock in, in the morning. We remember that. Let's pray one with the other that God will give strength and grace uh, to us all. Am I missing something? Okay. And so God will give grace to us all. Let's pray for the Lord to. Uh, great healing. You know, there's, there's so much going on in our world today. To think that someone would turn a resignation and then yeah. and go and, and, yeah. and just start shooting up in the place. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a depraved world uh, that we live in. And so the message to you, of course, you know, be careful at, at who you make mad while you're at work uh, and at home. <laughs> you should never know what's in the mind uh, of someone. Uh, be kind. Be prayerful as well. Be impactful. Uh, be, and, and not argumentative, uh, let's be the, the change of the world uh, uh, actually needs. Let, let's pray for the, the heroin uh, epidemic uh, yes. that's going on here in, in Hartford County, in Eastern Hartford County alone. Uh, let's pray uh, for the heroin uh, epidemic because uh, it's, it's, it's 
it's sad uh, to think that that's, uh, that's happening here. Uh, and so, and even those who, uh, people who pretend to lose their lives, you might save a life uh, by the idea that God would grant uh, to you. Uh, I believe that's all. Let's stand open oh, as you're standing. Go ahead and stand. Uh, I mentioned to you um, that our, our property tax is doing the building. Uh, it's due in July. Uh, and uh, you guys did fantastic on Sunday. You did great. Uh, we're asking you on Sundays, in your general offering on Sundays, please give on less than uh, $25 in the general offering. Now, if you're already giving uh, $25 or more, uh, thank you so much for that. If you, can, if you can add that, please do so. We really appreciate that. Now, if you were giving $50, $40, or $100, don't go down to $25. We're going to be saying you can give $25. Uh, please stay at that level. We really appreciate that. But if you can give extra, especially if you're already giving more, if you can give extra, please do that because there are others who 25 is going to be a stretch for them over these next several weeks. And, and they're going to have to really sacrifice. So you can help out somebody else by giving them a little extra and that will help out, especially if they can't do it every single week. So again, thank you, thank you so much. But we're asking everyone, please strive. Because if we can do that, we have to have any special offerings. We have to have any special uh, fundraisers or whatever. We can just do that through the general offering. And you can be great on Sunday. We're almost halfway there. We just need to be over the hump. And so thank you so much for what you are giving. Thank you, yes. Uh, you can give by cash app today uh, by the, the dollar sign ZT Cares. Sometimes like that's on. Uh, line right now, you guys can help us out. If you put the cash tag up there, so others can, can be joined and give. We appreciate that. Those who are watching by uh, YouTube Live, you guys can give. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your gifts when you do give on, online on Tuesdays. Uh, I know you're not here with us, but we really appreciate when you, you do give online. That helps us to keep uh, this service coming to you uh, via online. Let's all pray. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to bring to you your tithes and to our offering. Our request is to do this. Bless us indeed. Increase our more. Let your hand be on us. Keep us from evil. We'll bring honor and praise. Now we're going to bless you and keep your cause of faith upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. Let us count with you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.